My name is Ev Weinberg, and I'm a medical oncologist at UCLA who does a lot of um, research and clinical trials in uh, esophageal cancer, and it's a pleasure to be here. And so uh, my job is to guide through some of the treatment with uh, or diagnosis and treatment with a focus perhaps on the newer data that's been coming out the last uh, few years. So a lot of times we do clump esophageal and gastric cancer together as uh, oncologists and, and we look at them because there are many circumstances in which uh, gastroesophageal junction cancer is is one of the diagnoses we see a lot of and, and we know that globally uh, this is a huge cancer burden um, particularly in the eastern world but certainly in the western world as well where if you look at the new cases it's the third most in the world and deaths it's actually second most um, most of that is gastric cancer, but esophageal cancer to some extent as well. There are several different flavors of esophageal cancer, and by that I mean different histological subtypes, and we all know uh, what those are. The first one is squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, which has classical risk factors of uh, tobacco use and alcohol uh, use, along with a very important risk factor, HPV, which itself is uh, diminishing, um, perhaps uh, because of um, uh, the vaccine uh, availability of the HPV vaccine, but also a recognition that tobacco and alcohol use are important risk factors. And this cancer has decreased dramatically in the Western world, um, such that uh, it has become very rare, although in, in populations of alcohol abuse and tobacco use, it is still quite prevalent. And other rare risk factors listed here. Much more common in, in the Western world, certainly, and increasing in incidence is adenocarcinoma. And, and this is a, a very different histological subtype and is a very, very different um, biologically behaving disease, as we'll talk about tonight. And um, this disease is predominantly driven by uh, features like gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, dysplasia, uh, Barrett's esophagus, um, perhaps a uh, indirect linkage to obesity, and, and has a much different demographic uh, in that it's much more common in Caucasians, where squamous cell carcinoma is more common in uh, more minority populations. And it has been recognized that um, gastroesophageal cancer has gone up uh, dramatically in the Western world in the last number of years, whereas we see decreases in other histological subtypes like squamous cell and like distal gastric cancer. Quite the opposite is seen with GE junction and distal esophageal adenocarcinoma, which is going up. And you could see as advents in modern gastroenterology treatments, which have included uh, various iterations of, of medications and PPIs, and of course, more aggressive Barrett screening, um, we're able to detect uh, more of these cancers. And that may be one of the reasons why the incidence has gone up. But certainly, um, you could see here that squamous cell uh, has gone down as tobacco use has been much better controlled. So the reason uh, this is relevant in, in 2021 is, is that the treatment of advanced disease, and this is predominantly what we see, and this is what we'll go over in, in, in the United States and in the Western world, we see mostly advanced disease. We don't have screening. And it's changed dramatically um, and is continuing to change. And, and as the oncology side of it, we'll go over the management and, and even to some extent um, the multidisciplinary engagement has, has changed dramatically over the last number of years, whereas before it used to be a fairly simple problem, albeit unsatisfying, that patients were just treated with chemotherapy. And now, because of the advent of biomarkers and the suggestion of the different biological behavior of these cancers, we are now um, trying to get a lot more information in esophageal cancer patients before establishing an appropriate treatment plan. And as we'll go over tonight, these are all biomarker-driven things that are changing and in, in actually in real time to some extent. So what I really like about this disease and what really interests me um, is that if you look at the GI tract here from the esophagus running down to the stomach, um, you see very, very different diseases. Um, you see, as I mentioned, 
a on the top bar here, esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, which itself is squamous cell and histologically looks like head and neck cancer and behaves to some extent like head and neck cancer with the degree of large masses that are um, sometimes causing extreme dysphagia, but not usually spreading diffusely throughout the GI tract. Um, biologically and genomically, based on TCGA data sets and other genomic data sets that have been published, squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus is a lot more similar genomically to head and neck cancer than it is to um, esophageal adenocarcinoma, for example, just showing that within the same organ, the cancers themselves are so different. Um, we also know that, that TCGA has subclassified esophageal cancer and based on the different uh, molecular phenotypes of that cancer. And, um, you know, recognition of that has really led to some of the improvement as we'll talk about today. So nomenclature is important, and, and certainly in this disease, it's very important, I think, because we talk about, again, squamous cell being up top, and then esophageal adenocarcinoma is divided into three subtypes based on Seward classification, having to do with the proximity of the tumor to the gastroesophageal junction, often characterized as one, two, and three. And then further down, of course, is stomach cancer, which we won't talk about uh, too much tonight. So how do we treat esophageal cancer in 2021? So we're, so we're going to go over some of this, and I'll give you my opinion on the treatment of, of this. It's it's really falls into, um, if it's localized, and, and by that I mean it has been staged with an endoscopic ultrasound, and our goal is for a curative intent, um, then patients are often classified into surgical or non-surgical. And, um, you know, the way I look at it is if uh, you have adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, especially adeno, um, you would fall into chemotherapy and radiation, which is carboplatin paclitaxel with radiation followed by surgery. And now the new data would suggest followed by immunotherapy, um, as we'll talk about tonight at some length. If you are not fit for surgery and fall into the category of unfit medically for surgery has been deemed by medical providers. You end up going on to what's called definitive chemo radiation, which includes uh, a number of regimens that are often used with fractionated radiation, uh, giving concurrent chemotherapy during that time. Now, if you have squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, the paradigm is a little different in the sense that everybody agrees that um, surgery is is not as important to some extent, and more patients with squamous cell are now getting away with the non-surgical management, as we'll talk about. So in the United States um, and in the Western world, we do not do screening on, on unless for carefully selected patients. By that, I mean there are no clear screening guidelines for patients with esophageal cancer the way there are, for example, for gastric and esophageal cancer in China and in Japan and Korea. Uh, here we do not have routine screening. And as a consequence, almost all of the patients that we see in this country are found in either regional or distant disease, such that uh, the idea, idea to ablate and or uh, operate from the get-go without neoadjuvant treatment does not fall along um, most patients in this country. By the time we establish a diagnosis, we are already usually either regional, defined as uh, lymph node positive by endoscopic ultrasound or CT scan, or bulky disease, also defined by endoscopic ultrasound or CT scan, or even worse if disease has spread uh, to other organs such as the lungs or liver. So we recognize that in this country, when we see patients, by and large, the large, large majority, unfortunately, are already uh, regional or distant disease. And that launches us into a discussion about uh, with the surgeons and with the gastroenterologists and with the radiation oncologists um, as to the optimal management to try to cure patients, which includes, as I mentioned, definitive chemo radiation or neoadjuvant chemo radiation followed by surgery. So about 10 years ago, um, this landmark trial uh, changed the way we treated this cancer because these, this group in the Netherlands randomized patients um, to either surgery alone or neoadjuvant chemoradiation followed by surgery. And as you can see here, 
Um, it, the curves separated very early and quite consistently in the group of patients who got chemo radiation followed by surgery there was a clear survival improvement, um, meaning they lived longer. And also, for that matter, if you looked at the subtypes, the squamous cell patients um, did the best with surgery and, and did the worst if they had surgery alone. So, so they really benefited from chemo radiation, whereas an adenocarcinoma, it's less of an advantage, showing you just within the same organ how heterogeneous the disease is. So this became the standard of care at that time. And, and this is approximately, this is published about 10 years ago. So the premise was, we're not gonna go ahead and do an operation right away. And anybody who is basically T3 and zero or above, which included lymph nodes or big bulky disease, we're gonna treat neoadjuvantly. Now, a lot of information has come back since then and after that study recognizing how to um, prognosticate patients a little better with esophageal cancer and what are the key elements. We know that if we have a very good response before surgery, that bodes well for long-term prognosis, such that if you have a pathological CR, pathological complete response rate, the odds of cure are approximately 50 to 60%. So again, that's a huge prognostic variable that we always feel good about um, when we get a patient back who's had that complete pathological response and such that even with a 90% treatment effect, which means minimal residual disease, pathologically is also um, may have similar pathological, uh, may have similar results to those with a complete response. We know the patients with no negative disease do better than node positive, and we know the patients with reduced to T0, T0 or T1, as opposed to T2 to T4 post-treatment also do better. Um, we've established PET scan as often a very important way to follow and track patients during their neoadjuvant treatment and it's prognostic to some extent and predictive of how they'll do long-term. And we've developed molecular, as we'll talk about molecular prognostic features that can help us determine after a patient has had surgery, what's their risk of recurrence and, and you know how often surveillance should be done or, or how to do it. So a lot of information's changed um, the way we as oncologists treat this. There's been a huge amount of, of study done on do you need radiation, do you need chemotherapy. Um, they tried to take radiation out and they tried to take chemo out and go with radiation alone and vice versa. And essentially, the uh, to summarize a lot of the last 10 years of work, the conclusion was that if the disease is predominantly esophageal in nature, which means um, squamous cell always and adenocarcinoma, anything that's not involving the G-junction, or G-junction and above, I should say, should get chemo radiation first, in my opinion. And if patients are below the esophagus, so the tumor starting in the cardia and below, um, those patients may not need radiation and, and may simply benefit by chemotherapy alone, which is neoadjuvant, treated more along the lines of how we treat stomach cancer, which is not as radiosensitive and often treated with chemotherapy alone followed by surgery. And the strategy really has diff differed depending on, on where the patients live, who the strategy is, Asia versus Europe versus the United States. These studies have been have very different connotations depending on geographically where the patients are located. So when we focus, the oncologist unfortunately tends to see his patients very advanced disease. We, we tend to see the patients often with, as I mentioned, at least heavily local regional, if not early metastatic disease. We now recognize that we can subdivide patients from the beginning with esophageal cancer and, and base it on um, certain biological features. The first most important thing is, as we'll talk about what the histology is, squamous cell versus adeno. Then we like to know what's called MSI status, which is microsatellite instability. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. We also want to know the HER2 status, which is a biomarker for breast and esophagogastric cancer. And now more recently, CPS score, which is combined positive score, which also indicates a positive positive uh, predictive value for immunotherapy drugs, as I'll talk about. So immunotherapy, we'll start there because the oncologists, uh, you know, the majority of our research has to do now with immunotherapy drugs. And these are essentially drugs 
um, that stimulate the immune system um, in different manipulations to recognize the cancer as foreign. And the reason this has brought on a lot of enthusiasm and excitement is that we know that with time, chemotherapy, generally speaking, cannot cure patients um, with this disease or, in, or most diseases for that matter. And even the advent of targeted therapy hasn't been able to cure patients necessarily. But immunotherapy does have in select patients an element of, of cure, which means that some patients, particularly even some patients with this terrible disease I have now that are cured and have been cured because of their very receptive to immune therapy approaches. And generally speaking, um, when we talk about immunotherapy, we talk about the various ways in which manipulating the immune system through medications or vaccines, um, both the innate immune system um, and the adaptive immune system. So both T cells, your inherent T cell and, and, and or dendritic cells and other macrophages that are also felt to respond to cancer. Um, if they can be manipulated and, and um, stimulated in such a way to work against the cancer, then that has been obviously a huge, uh, a huge progress in the field of, of treating against cancer. And, um, you know, this is a very, very complicated field. Uh, it's getting more complicated. Uh, we've had a number of these drugs approved for a number of years. We'll talk about some of those. We have thousands of clinical trials ongoing with immunotherapy. It is a huge blockbuster field in medical oncology, as it is in many other fields. And we're just trying to scratch the surface in some ways at trying to understand um, the role of these drugs. So in 2020, um, if you ask any oncologist for that matter, we all talk about immunotherapy because we all recognize that's been the direction in which uh, oncology drug development is going. Um, it started as being uh, targeted therapy, going after selected targets. And for the last 10 years or so, it's been all about immunotherapies. And, and you can see here just hundreds of the ways in which you're doing that. And the reason that is important is that there's a recognition that the degree of tumor antigens, which means the tumor load can be quantified now into tumor antigens called neoantigens. And if you have more neoantigens and um, you are more sensitive to immunotherapy and some of the cancers that are among the most sensitive to immunotherapy have been uh, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, and certain subtypes of other uh, GI cancers actually, as we'll talk about. And esophageal kind of falls towards the top, not, not absolutely the top, but certainly more on the top than, let's say, other diseases like pancreatic and colorectal cancer, which are also diseases of the GI tract that themselves are not very immunosensitive at all, as you can see here. So the simplest way to know nowadays in 2020, if or 2021, I should say, if someone is sensitive to immunotherapy is to do basic mismatch repair protein immunohistochemistry, which as we all know, are the four mismatch repair proteins associated with a uh, microsatellite instability. They confer microsatellite instability to the tumor, what's called MSI. And um, those are proteins that are also gene genetically linked and cause uh, Lynch syndrome, which is of course very common for a gastroenterologist to know about because it causes the most common genetic predisposition of colorectal cancer. Um, but any GI cancer can have microsatellite instability, sporadic microsatellite instability by virtue of a somatic mutation in one of these four mismatch proteins, MLH1, PMS2, MSH6, and MSH2. And it's a very simple test actually that we now um, can do Im by immunistic chemistry. And we try at our institution and certainly at lo most large institutions to know in every advanced um, gastrointestinal cancer, including esophageal cancer, what the MSI status is. Because if it's MSI high, it suggests, as I'll talk about in a minute, a very strong predisposition to immunotherapy. And those patients are no longer treated with chemotherapy, in fact, but now the recommendation is to start with one of the checkpoint inhibitors, such as pembrolizumab and, uh, or nivolumab. And I'll go over some of that data now um, uh, to go over it in detail. So 
earlier this year, a very large randomized phase three, the largest randomized phase three clinical trial actually ever performed in metastatic, and in, in, sorry, local advanced esophageal cancer was presented, not yet published. It's in press, I'm told, but not yet published. And this trial was presented at our annual oncology meeting, ESMO, uh, six months ago. And what the trial did is they randomized patients after, as I mentioned before, who got neoadjuvant chemo radiation, followed by esophagectomy, to either nivolumab, and nivolumab is a PD-1 inhibitor, which inhibits the uh, PD-1 axis um, by blocking it on the T cells, the checkpoint on the T cells. And they randomized patients to either nivolumab or placebo, because after surgery, these patients, the standard of care at that time was just observation. And this was a huge, huge effort. They enrolled nearly 800 patients, randomizing them two to one to either nivolumab or placebo. And the endpoint of the study was how many patients would, first of all, disease-free survival. So how, when would the patients recur with their esophageal cancer? And the results were practice changing in my view, um, in that, uh, and I, I should mention first, uh, well, first I'll go to the curves. This is the disease-free survival. And the disease-free survival measures uh, how long it took a patient to recur. So historically, it took about a year in someone without a complete pathological response. I should mention all of those patients had some residual disease pathologically after esophagectomy. And, and, and those were the patients that were randomized, 800 of those people. They still had residual disease, either lymph node positive disease or a T2 lesion on pathology. And they were randomized to either placebo or nivolumab. And the standard of care, as I mentioned, was placebo, or not placebo, but observation, for which there was approximately a year of disease-free survival expectation, which meant that on average, median, would be a year from the time of their surgery to the time they recurred in their lungs or liver and whatnot. And you can see here um, this drug nivolumab, which is pretty easy to administer given every four weeks um, in, in certain dose and schedule. Uh, as as non chemotherapy doubled the m disease free survival, um, so really quite uh, dramatic for us in this field, and immediately became, I would say, standard of care, um, and has already been used in this context after surgery. Um, now, not yet FDA approved because this just got presented, and and we don't yet see overall survival information. That'll take another year, I suspect, um, at least. But um, certainly very compelling and, and also really uh, surprising in a lot of ways that um, this disease, by giving that drug immunotherapy for a year, you can prevent recurrences to a large extent. Now, when we looked at some of the particulars, as you can see in these uh, hazard ratios and this forest plots here, you could see that the squamous cell patients down here may have benefited a little more than the adeno patients. And that's, you know, that's not a huge surprise considering the squamous cell is felt to be a more immunogenic tumor. Um, but across the board, regardless of whether you had lymph node negative disease and just T, T2 or lymph node positive disease, you did indeed get benefit from the addition of um, nivolumab over placebo. So this, as I mentioned, became the standard of care um, and we're awaiting FDA approval. So landmark moment there. We had another landmark moment in first-line metastatic disease in which chemotherapy, which was the standard of care is 5-FU cisplatin versus 5-FU cisplatin placebo, I should say, versus 5-FU cisplatin pembrolizumab, which is another PD-L1 inhibitor, also affects uh, checkpoints on the T cells. They enrolled nearly 700 patients on this study, randomized one-to-one uh, -one versus pembrolizumab plus chemo versus chemo alone. And here are the results you could see first in the squamous cell population where the green curve was patients who got pembrolizumab plus chemo versus chemo alone, had a very large survival advantage. Whether you had CPS score, which stands for combined composite positive score, which is a biomarker for checkpoints, and, and we also are getting that on all of our patients now, a CPS score. Um, or not, you got benefit from the addition of pembrolizumab over chemotherapy statistically. And this impacted not just progression-free survival, but impacted overall survival. Uh, the people who had the high CPS scores 
which means they have a high amount of staining of pdl one on their tumor or on their lymphocytes or T cells for that matter, or any immune cells for that matter, had a better advantage, um, indicating it is a predictive biomarker. Um, but all patients had a statistically significant advantage as well. And here you could see in these subgroup analyses, indeed, um, you know, the, the group of patients with squamous cell may have gotten slightly more benefit, suggesting again that the squamous cell histology is a more immunogenic cell type, more responsive to manipulations of the immune system um, than adenocarcinoma. Now, when we measured response rate, um, uh, response rate measures how much a tumor can shrink on the CAT scan. Uh, here you did see that it went up from about 30% with the chemotherapy alone to 45% with the addition of, of the immunotherapy. So based on these two studies, immunotherapies now become the standard of care in all patients with frontline esophageal cancer, uh, not gastric yet, but esophageal cancer certainly. And um, again, thinking about which patients, it has to do with their CPS score. If their CPS is above 10, all the more reason to give it. Squamous cell, all the more reason to give it. Um, but recognition that these drugs do have side effects. And, and here you can see um, the side effects of immunotherapy are not usually worse than chemo, but they can be idiosyncratic. Some patients can get, uh, many of the GI doctors have seen, immune side effects in the colon, colitis, as a consequence of manifesting in extreme diarrhea, which requires uh, steroid use. They, these drugs are absolutely contraindicated in patients with strong autoimmune disease histories. Um, certainly ulcerative colitis is, is not a situation where we would feel comfortable for the most part using these drugs. Now, these drugs were also studied in uh, second line, and I'm not gonna go through this real fast, but second line metastatic esophageal cancer um, is a disease that is a very short survival, unfortunately. And here you could see that when compared um, to the chemotherapy, compared head to head to chemotherapy, um, pembrolizumab did better, particularly in, in squamous cell patients. And I've participated in a lot of these trials and have done work with a number of these companies, I should mention. And I, I do believe that overall, if we select the right patients for these drugs, it's actually um, nowadays with esophageal cancer, probably the right thing to do at some point to, to get exposure to a, a checkpoint inhibitor. And this, I'll go through it quickly through this. So I have a typical case of mine that I decided to present here. 67-year-old um, patient with distal esophageal adenocarcinoma. We get referred to these all the time through our GI colleagues who's presenting with uh, dysphagia and, and weight loss. I never had even had an endoscopy before. We, we come at it from an oncology angle, so spare me. I'm, I'm not a gastroenterologist. The patients are referred from the GI doctors, and we... Um, we as oncologists uh, consider this a very multidisciplinary disease. So we have our bi-monthly esophageal tumor board and then um, where everybody calls in and, and we all give our, our opinions. And we like to see the photos from the GI docs and the images from the radiologists. But this tumor here is a typical story of being described as being in the distal esophagus, but well above the GEJ, so classified as a Seward type 1. HER2 was 2 plus by IHC, and we always, as I mentioned, like to get these biomarkers. The four biomarkers we always like to get now are HER2, MSI status, and CPS score, three biomarkers, I should say. CPS score, HER2, and MSI that we request our pathologists give us on every patient with esophageal cancer. The CT scans showed no metastatic disease, thickening of the gastroesophageal junction and the distal esophagus, um, but no clear evidence. So then the case was discussed at our tumor board. Uh, the patient was uh, felt that he wanted surgery, was seen by the thoracic surgeons. Um, we tend to refer all of these patients to the thoracic surgeons, although sometimes if the tumors are sufficiently below or at the GE junction, they get the gastric surgeons involved as well. That's really a battle that goes on uh, seemingly weekly at our tumor boards. Um, but we offered the patient uh, endoscopic ultrasound, which was done, uh, I should mention, and staged the patient as a T3N1. So the patient decided he wanted to have surgery uh, and ended up going after neoadjuvant chemo radiation for surgery. He got the cross regimen, which as I mentioned, is a standard of care for six weeks. He tolerated it. 
um, moderately, and I will say moderately because he did have esophagitis, which is the most common side effect of chemo radiation, um, not requiring a feeding tube placement, placement, but requiring supportive care um, with our nutrition consultations and also with um, periodic IV hydration, but not TPN. Um, ultimately, patient was sent back to surgery and, and underwent a, a esophagectomy after a long discussion. Um, and then the pathology final path report was T2N1. So we'd qualify him as a mild responder, not fantastic, um, but certainly not um, uh, as good as we would like. As I mentioned, complete pathological response or 90% pathological response defined as lymphonegative disease is the best prognostic uh, features for this kind of patient. But this patient had still two positive lymph nodes and ultimately uh, the standard of care at that time was observation and the patient was observed. But six months later, unfortunately, a CT scan showed uh, multiple enlarged lymph nodes with, with um, suspicious uh, metastatic disease. So we, we often will do a repeat biopsy at that point, um, either for clinical trial eligibility or just to confirm that it's 100% metastatic disease and not just uh, reactive lymph nodes. This patient did have a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma that was MSS, microsatellite stable, so non-MSI, had a CPS score of five and, and was started on a commonly used chemotherapy regimen uh, called Folfox. Unfortunately, didn't work for very long because six months later he had disease progression and then um, uh, started on pembrolizumab and has been on that with standard of care, which has been better tolerated. And, and the thing that we felt good about for pembrolizumab was the fact that he had a uh, at CPS score of greater than five. So that's kind of the way the oncologist manage these patients looking at the biomarkers. Um, and, you know, squamous cell is dealt with differently. And I'll, I'll use this example as a squamous cell patient because uh, Trish asked me to select a few cases. So I thought this would be interesting. So this is a patient also heavy smoker um, who presents with uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Um, has real adenophagia and dysphagia on eating solids and liquids, 30 pound weight loss, also never had an endoscopy before. This tumor is very different. This tumor is up in the mid esophagus, um, nearly obstructing. Pathology showed squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma is almost never MSI high, which makes it distinct from adenocarcinoma and also um, is usually uh, CPS higher, as I mentioned. So, so we do like for those biomarkers. And the CT scans unfortunately showed, which is not uncommon in someone with that large a mass, uh, pulmonary disease with uh, multiple pulmonary nodules, which unfortunately qualified the patient as having metastatic disease. Um, the patient at that point underwent a stent placement. Um, but didn't have significant improvement in that. And prior to chemotherapy, the discussion was with you, which you have with a lot of these patients is if the stent isn't sufficient, we should consider a feeding tube, um, which was placed. And um, that allows us to treat the patient without a feeding tube sometimes in these terribly obstructing esophageal cancers, we, we have a tough time giving them any treatment at all. But the patient did get started on, on chemotherapy on a clinical trial um, with 5-FU cisplatin, which as I mentioned is one of the standards. And the chemo was poorly tolerated. Um, this patient developed a very common side effect with immunotherapy, which is hypothyroidism, which is a reflection perhaps of antibody production um, against the thyroid gland produced by uh, the surge of T-cells or T-cells against the thyroid gland. And, and so as a consequence, the patient was treated for uh, hypothyroidism, ultimately started on palliative radiation therapy, um, but chemotherapy stopped working and the patient disease spread. Um, so, you know, when we think about these diseases, we're, we're always trying to think about um, finding the right patients for the right biomarkers. I'll highlight uh, two clinical trials that um, we're doing right now, which hopefully will be changing the field. The first one is this study, uh, which is looking at definitive chemoradiation. As I mentioned, um, 
chemo radiation is itself a uh, standard of care for many patients with advanced esophageal cancer who can't undergo surgery. A lot of our patients are above the age of 75 or 80. And for them, quite frankly, uh, esophagectomy is not an easy thing. So um, we like to offer definitive chemo radiation to some of those patients we don't consider to be adequate surgical candidates. And, and this, these tri are trials trying to do better than the standard of care, which is chemotherapy. Again, focusing on immunotherapy or the next generation, which is second line immunotherapy or second generation immunotherapy drugs. So um, these are uh, the com some of the large clinical trials that are ongoing now that some of which were participating at UCLA and other sites. So I mentioned earlier, one big focus of oncology is immunotherapy. I'll just spend a few last minutes talking about another big focus of ours, which is targeted therapy. And if we want to be optimists in this disease, we'll look at a disease like lung cancer, which in 2003 was treated as one single disease. And now, as you can see here on the pie chart on the right, has multiple, multiple biomarkers that are drawn at every patient with lung cancer, a number of which have really good drugs that have changed the landscape of non-small cell lung cancer. So lung cancer, when I was training, was the absolute worst cancer to get, and now, um, or, and or melanoma, and those two diseases have many, many more options than most of our GI cancer. So in 15 years, they've gone from having treating it as one cancer with chemotherapy alone to having about 20 different experimental or novel drugs, and, and really not just having the drugs, but changing the paradigm of the disease, changing the survival expectations for all patients um, with either locally advanced or metastatic lung cancer. So we should, we always say, you know, as a joke, hey, we should look at them as a good example, but it is true actually now with diseases like esophageal cancer. And so one of the issues is, is always going to be how much tissue we get. And we bother our gastroenterologists all the time, um, which they don't like. And sometimes they get angry with me. Uh, my good friends in GI, are on, some of them are on this call, I could see. But we annoy them because we really like to get core biopsies so we can look at as much di different tissue as we can. We send these tumors now not just satisfied with um, three or four genes of interest, but nowadays we send almost every cancer patient with esophageal cancer for what's called next generation sequencing, which looks at hundreds and even thousands of genes to look for those needles in a haystack. And the way to think about it is if you're only looking at one or two genes, you're not looking at enough. And so if you look at uh, this slide, you can see just how many different genetic manipulation. This is just one uh, exon within a gene. So if you're able to look at it with hundreds and thousands of genes and a full next generation sequencing panel, you have a lot more opportunity to offer your patients um, novel, exciting therapies. So um, that's something that we've been very mindful of the last few years in, in esophageal cancer. So that before we were able to say, gosh, a person has um, esophageal cancer, adeno and squamous, and now we can classify them into any number of these groups. And, and here at UCLA, we have approximately 15 clinical trials offering patients um, new novel therapies, depending on what biomarker they have of their disease. And so esophageal adenocarcinoma, esophageal gastric adenocarcinoma, doesn't have a lot of these slots filled out, as you can see compared to lung cancer, but we're starting to get there. We are starting to get uh, three or four, as I alluded to in this lecture, um, bio actionable biomarkers. And, and I'm optimistic that the next 10 years, um, you know, we'll continue to have a lot of improvement with uh, molecular and immunotherapy combinations so that we can essentially guide our patients through more of a personalized landscape. One drug that I've been interested in for a long time is FGFR2B, and, and we just presented data will hopefully lead to an FDA approval of that classification. So we recognize that tissue is not always easy to get, and so the field has caught up a little. You'll hear the oncologists using terms like liquid biopsies, in which we do 
blood-based testing in an effort to capture circulating tumor DNA, which can often correspond as sufficient for a lot of these genes that we're able to pick up um, in high allele frequency uh, measurements of certain genetic of uh, proteins and genes um, that themselves, either through cell-free DNA, can can be almost as good as tissue. It's not quite the standard, but but a lot of the new studies are designing these prospectively, such that nowadays when we draw when we enroll patients in studies at UCLA and we look at patients prospectively, we're checking along the line multiple times. A circulating tumor DNA um, in parallel with sometimes with tissue so that like five years down the road, we'll be able to understand, oh, this was a marker of resistance to this pathway, or that was a marker of sensitivity to that pathway. And that's the kind of studies that the whole field is excited about. And, and we could see here that at least if you look at simplistically and Garden360 is one of the other companies that does a lot of this uh, CTDNA testing, you can see that it's not quite as good as, as tissue, but it's catching up. And, and the technology is really booming right now with circulating tumor DNA. There are a number of companies that have almost, um, you know, improved dramatically the ability to detect um, any number of genes uh, via the bloodstream. So, how will we improve patient outcomes? I, I think it's going to, and I'm going to stop next slide, is, is going to be focusing, continuing to focus on multidisciplinary care. I mean, this is not a disease that any single doctor can manage. It's very complicated. Uh, GI, we work with our gastroenterologists, uh, especially after a diagnosis to establish um, improved nutrition, um, stenting if needed. We need uh, an outstanding nutrition team like we have here at UCLA. Um, the endpoints of quality life have now been heightened. It's not just about quantity. It's not just about overall survival, but in fact, uh, making sure that the drugs are more tolerable. Um, I personally believe that HPV vaccination um, gradually over time, as we there's data that you know we are going to see less and less of HPV-associated malignancies, not just um, uh, not just necessarily uh, cervical cancer, but other HPV malignancies like head and neck cancer and perhaps esophageal cancer as well. So in summary, um, esophage esophageal cancer is among the most heterogeneous of cancers. It's really a very diverse group of diseases, which I think makes it very interesting to study. Um, it remains a multidisciplinary disease. Um, new approaches are needed and um, we're working on all sorts of new novel agents um, to develop better targets and drugs for this disease. Uh, I wanna thank you all for your attention today.